And <clears throat> I have not yet held up your book, oh. Settle for More, this phenomenal memoir that actually got kind of cribbed for the movie Bombshell. It did get cribbed, and we did not get any money. No royalties on that. No one paid whatsoever. us a dime. But, Nor uh, would I have sold them. Also a great and an, an inspiring book. And a lot of, like, just your style. You're, as I say about you, you're not a perfectionist, but you're an exceptionalist. And so if you're going to put your name on anything, it has to be great. And so this ended up being a ton of work yeah. for, you to, for you to put out. It so. was. It was nonstop. And uh, I don't know. It, I'm glad I wrote it because it was a crazy period of time for us. And so it'll always be a marker mm -hmm. for where we were at that point in our lives and what I'd learned so far. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure in another 40 years, I'll write another one, another you know memoir about what happened yeah. after. And hopefully it'll be much more insightful and won't completely undermine everything I've said there. But I still, my life philosophy remains the same. The Settle for More thing is still real. The second one's gonna be a happier book. I feel like you are fully hitting your stride. Our, where we are as a family with our kids and your work, it's just I'm like, knock wood. I gotta knock on some wood or have a sip or something because- No, we're just gonna manifest it. it. We're gonna manifest greatness. We don't okay. need a knock. Well, it's working. Yeah. This lady and we, we're gonna have a great next 40. This, this weird lady, her, her <laughs> face. For the listening audience, there's a, there's a face and we're in my studio and there's this like face of this woman. It's just kind of a cool addition to the studio. And I got it, I was like, well, who is that? Because what if this person is not a fan? And the next thing we hear, she starts complaining about being on the Megyn Kelly show, but we're good because it's AI generated. It's AI, yeah. All right, let's go with book number one. We'll intersperse with more, you know, witty banter, but. What is your first Mother's Day book pick? Well, I try to pick different ones depending on what your interest is. And I fully stand by this one, no matter who you are. It's called Decades and it's by Joseph Massey, mm -hmm. double S E Y. You can get it on Amazon. And there's a lot I love about this book, but his poetry, it's a book of poetry. And I'm not a huge poetry reader, but his poems make me feel the way you feel when you open up the curtains on a winter morning and you see two feet of snow and the fat snowflakes still coming down. Mm -hmm. It just, he captures these little moments of nature in our world around us. And I just sights like the reflection of an old hotel in a puddle that make you stop in your tracks and feel the thing he's communicating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's got a real way with them word things. <laughs> and the thing I love about Massey too is He's completely self-made now. He was this rising poet in the poetry world. He was getting all these laudatory reviews from the New York Times and other places. And then he got me too'd off of, frankly, just a BS situation. It was an ex-girlfriend who was bitter about how it ended. It didn't end well, he admits that. But it wasn't like he was harassing and Harvey Weinsteining people. He just like, had a bad relationship that went south. So the poetry world completely turned on him. I mean, they are the meanest mofos you've ever done. Poetries. I mean, like you wouldn't think that the poetry world would be so would, vicious. Would get the knives out. No, they're terrible. <clears throat> so he got railroaded out of the industry and was really sad and writes openly about his, the depression that followed and how low he was. And now he's rebounded and he's writing his own stuff and he's publishing, self-publishing but you can get the stuff on Amazon, so it's relatively easy. And so I love the fact that you can give somebody that gift of that feeling with the snow. Um, and you can also support somebody who's finding a way around. It's great to see there, there are more avenues, as you say, wait your way around. There are more avenues for the cream to rise to the top. If he's good and if he's worth a follow. And by the way, he's a great Twitter follow. And I yes. just today, it's funny you say that because he had a photo out this morning that I saw on Twitter. And it's a photo of a little drop of water sort of just before it, falls off the twig, you know, a branch. It's like, a, it's a sort of bubbling out and it was reflecting the tree around it. It was a really beautiful photo. And I think he titled it Spring or something like that. Well, his photography is just as beautiful as his poetry. Yeah. So I just think this is something any woman would love to receive. It's just, it's a gift of making you feel a certain way. The poems are not too long. It's a quick read. Something you can pick up and put down easily. Anyway, I think everyone will love it. All right, Decades by Joseph Massey. I want to have him on the show actually, because I have not yet had a poet. I've had songwriters like Rick Springfield. I've had, I've had memoirists like Paulina Poroskova and even like David Duchovny has come on. He's written some good fiction and graphic novels Duchovny has. He's so a I've great had a talker. range of stuff. He'd but be I'd good love for dedicated because he's a okay. good talker. Good. I'll have him on then uh, if, if he's willing to come in. But you got to, that's the thing. You got to come into New York City. You got to have a cocktail. Like there's a price to pay. You I can't just, do it. you know, come in by Zoom for this. I think he'd love to meet you, Duggar. All right. Book number two for Mother's mm -hmm. Day. Mm. 
Okay, so this one is more just pure fun. Um, it's called Wrong Place, Wrong Time by Jillian McAllister. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember having so much fun reading a book. It's just, it's, I, I can tell you how it opens and then, you know, I'll leave it at that. But it opens with a mother watching her late teen son engage in a deadly altercation on the street. And he commits what looks like a murder. She winds up at the police station with him. She's distraught. She doesn't understand at all how her otherwise well-behaved son has gotten to this point. And she can't bail him out. She goes home, she falls asleep. And when she wakes up, she's back in time by a couple of days, a day or two. Mm -hmm. And then she lives that day. And then she goes to sleep and she's back further in time. And she unravels the mystery through these leaps backward in time about this particular circumstance and her life. Mm -hmm. Really, really enjoyed it. Oh, that's a great concept for a book. There was some movie with Guy Pierce, I think, where he was going backwards in time, or maybe he had a short-term memory or something, kept replaying it or something. But that, that sounds great. I want to read that one. Yeah. Did I you mean, do that audio or? I did that audio. I, yeah. I just think it's, it's so fun, like the concept of time travel. And I, as yeah. you know, I love mystery and I love anything crimey. So I enjoyed that from start to finish. You love, I, I don't know if there's a dateline with Camo, as we call him, Keith Morrison, that you haven't heard no. or, or watched on TV. I do not miss that. And you know, the thing about Dateline that I really like is they don't ever get too graphic. Yeah. Like I enjoy true crime, but I Camo, don't- Camo, he's tasteful. He is tasteful. Tasteful murders. And he, right, he's so enjoyable to just listen to. You know, <laughs> people listen to that guy read the phone book. But I met him too when I was at NBC and he's just yeah. a complete doll. And he does a great job of storytelling. He writes yeah. those scripts for sure. That's him. That's his own special. Is that right? Because it's, it's such a well-produced thing. Like there's a yes. 2020 is fine, but it seems like Dateline is maybe a notch above in terms of production it's value. It's way above. It's way yeah. above. It was the best thing of my experience at NBC to yeah. be able to work for, with those producers and those editors and those reporters. That They were top notch. So I love Dateline too. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, just so listeners know, if I ever look over at Meg and I see the little AirPods in, 50-50, she's doing a news podcast, which, which is all over the board. I mean, you listen to 10 different news podcasts a day from all spectrums of the you know political left-right ideology, or it's Dateline. Yeah, or an audiobook. Sometimes it's, it's an audiobook, but yeah. Dateline is my default. It's nice to fall asleep to like a little gentle murder. <laughs> if, if it's an audiobook, Within that category, there's a 50-50 chance it's the Streisand memoir, which oh my is going to take 10 years to finish. I'm not, I'm pulling a Doug Brunt. I'm, oh. I'm not giving up. You're, just, I, <laughs> you're going to fight through it. I always tell you to abandon these books <laughs> that are so long that you don't really enjoy. They're, it's like, yeah. I don't know, that, that one on, was it Hiroshito? I don't, it went oh, on yeah, yeah, forever. Yeah. Japanese it, it was emperor. like twice as long yeah, as the Barbara Streisand. Here yeah, there. It was dry, but it was like, there was information in there, but my God, it was dry. And I'm like, just put it away, put it aside, honey. Yeah. And you were like, no, anyway, yeah. normally I will abandon if I'm bored, but I, I'm i not bored by the Barber book. It's just interminable. Yeah. It just never ends. How but many I hours like is these the stories. audio book? I, don't, I only like have like a, more, another right? 900 to go. <laughs> I don't, I'll get back to you. I think I'm going to be her age by the time I finish it. I'm getting better at abandoning a book. There, there are times now. There are just so many that I'm, I'm now that I'm doing the show as well and a lot of research for my own writing. There are so many books I need to get through that I'm being a little more discerning. It used to take a lot for me if I started a book. Yeah, it would take. A, it would have to be really bad for me not to finish. Now it's my bar is a little lower to put it down. I know, but who was it? Was it Amor Tolls who was giving you the math on how many books you'll get to read yeah. between now and the time we die? Many, many, many years from now, and that. That was like a wake up call for you. The math is depressing. You know, yeah. if you figure you read a book a month, some that's, I, I'm, you know, with work and things. I mean, now I read for work, which is wonderful. It's like, I get to watch movies for work, you know? So it has that kind of a feel. So I'm reading more like a book or two a week, but most people, you know, a book a month, two is a, is a, is a big pace. So let's say it's two, that's 20, call it 25 books a year. And if we're going to live for, you know, 30 more years. 30. That's, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, F say 50 more years. Yeah, let's go with 50. And that, now, now I've like, I, I was trying to set up a math situation that I can do in my head <laughs> right now. So 50 more years, that'd be 250, call it a thousand books a year. We're gonna read like 800 or a thousand more books in our life. Yeah. So, you know, you gotta, gotta choose to wisely. Me. You're the avid reader in the family. I read a lot, but not, not as many books. I'm reading news all day. So yeah. it's like, I mean, if I wanna listen to a book, is it, you know. Uh, I love that you have that doctor app, something like your, your, 
information can come in and you can convert it to audio. So even if it comes in in a PDF I form. I love it, yes. You, can, you know those doctor things where it's like voice to text or yeah. text to voice? Yeah, voice so dream. Voice, voice dream is what I use, D voice dream. Yeah. And it, it'll it read anything to me and I love it. And it's, it's just, you can do your makeup, you can do anything you want while you're taking Cook it. Cook lasagna like you cooked last night, which was phenomenal. Trigger. <laughs> <laughs> we have a running joke in the family that lasagna, if you do it right, if you do it well, the way she does it, there's so many steps involved. You got to like get the meat sauce going and then separately this, and then you got to make the bechamel sauce. Yes. By the time she finishes, it's so good. But she, her, her like she's on her last nerve. <laughs> and so everyone's like tiptoeing, like mom's a little upset. She made a lasagna today. <laughs> you, it's now to the point where we'll say to the kids like, hey, we're doing lasagna. And they're like, oh, oh. Yeah. oh it's not <laughs> worth it. It's not worth it. It actually is worth it. It was We've so good. We figured out. If I, I can, I'll make it just fine. But if we add on making the salad and setting the table, I start to get upset. Yeah, that's too much. Yeah. No, no one person can do all that. No, we got to rein it back. Yeah. So I'll do the salad. Kids will set the table. As it should be. Off we go. Yeah. All right. Third book. By the way, before you say the third book, yeah. I just wanted to say, because I, I think I know what your third book is and it's nonfiction, right? Yeah. The best children's book we ever read to the kids was Big Pumpkin. Love I mean, I love Goodnight Big Moon. Pumpkin. There's there, the crayons quit the day the crown. That was fun too. There, there are a number of good ones, but Big Pumpkin somehow we just got, even I was sort of lured into that hypnotic repetition of like Big Pumpkin it's said wonderful. the vampire. We loved Big Pumpkin. I also yeah. like the Little Blue Truck series. Oh, those are good. Those yeah. are really good. I miss those days. I little. know. We didn't throw those away. Like, you know, some of the ones- that, The favorites we still yeah, have. Yeah, they kind of moved yeah. on, but the favorites, you can't part with them. You just sat there with them so many times reciting these. Yeah. It's it, it's its its own form of poetry. They're little bodies in your lap. You know, now they're like longer than we are. You can't even have them in your lap anymore. I know. Or what's the one that, you know, that makes me cry every time? It's so, it's really terrible, frankly. Oh, uh, yeah. Where, where the it's man like, carries the- Yes, he carries the mother. Off. The yeah. mother keeps picking him up and like she sings the song to him and then finally she can't pick him up anymore. And then he picks her up. Oh my God, we'll, oh. we'll remember it. Oh. Devastating, don't buy that one. As my dad said, all the phases are, are great. We're moving into the next phases. All right, third and uh, final Mother's Day book pick. So I love Abigail Schreier who wrote one of the most important books I've ever read, which was Irreversible Damage. Mm -hmm. And she's followed it up now with Bad Therapy and it's out right now. Um, and I do think this is actually also really important. It takes a hard look at the over-therapization of children. And, you know, I'm very pro-therapy. I've been to lots of therapy. She's got some questions in there about adult therapy as well. But it's about how we're therapizing these children now in school with non-trained, you know, armchair therapists who don't have any sort of appropriate degree, yeah. who are also <clears throat> really into trauma porn, so, you know, every day at school now, the teacher's like, okay, think of a trauma and how did you handle it? And they're trying to bring the child back to something terrible that happened to him or her, which in and of itself is not great for them. You know, it's like they come to school, they're ready to learn math and they want, somebody wants them to espouse their worst trauma and like, how'd you deal with it? Okay, great. Okay, so now on to Pythagoras. It's not that easy. <laughs> And the person trying to do it is nine times out of 10, not that, that qualified. So yeah. I think well, that it's actually I mean, really- I feel like we probably all know a few people who are therapists now. And we think back like that person, they were a disaster, you know, but it yeah. makes sense because they were in therapy all their lives. And the, because they were exposed to so much, they, they somehow think they can then become the teacher. And then, so these very troubled people become therapists. I, it just, just perpetuates the cycle. I also really believe at this point in my life that immersing yourself in past traumas is very counterproductive. I am not a licensed therapist, but this is my own personal belief. I love my therapist who I've had for years now because he's only forward looking and like present focused to focus. Like, how do you feel about that? And mm -hmm. what can you do to change it? And like, what's within your power now to make this situation better? It's, he's never asked me about my, you know, like, what was it like when you got bullied in seventh grade? By the way, it's in the book, Settle for More again. <laughs> number one New York Times bestseller. Um, but he doesn't want to get into that. And that's helpful to me. I don't want to get into it either. And it, yeah. I'm telling you at 53, I now believe that compartmentalization is the way to go. Like yeah. <laughs> immersing yeah. yourself in the bad things is not a great way to go through life. Yeah, yeah. There's there. I mean, the classic sort of revisit things with your mom and your dad and like, there's probably some of that, but a lot of it has got to be more like, here are some tools to handle it yes. rather than like, let's go spend How an hour How do you manage the feelings when you're feeling them? 
Yeah. I think that's the really, that's the main important question in therapy. How do you manage the feelings when you're feeling them? He's big into cognitive behavioral therapy. And as you know, I've said this to you before, I boil it down to, okay, when you're talking yourself into the very scary place, something terrible is going to happen to me, a child, whatever, you can do that. You know, your brain might want to take you there, but you must, you required to make the counter list. Mm -hmm. What are the odds? It's not going to happen. What are the arguments mm -hmm. against this stuff that you're feeding into your own head? That works really well. All right, Abigail, so all three authors I want to have on dedicated, they are, they are hereby invited anytime to come into New York City, have a drink. Yeah. And, uh, and come on the show and talk about their life and their work and their most recent book. 